it's my first time in, in Colombia, and when I arrived here, I realized that Colombians, they, they take cosmology very seriously, because you see, even in the, in the bottle of water, they have, <laughs> so, so it, 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 you, should, you should take these guys seriously. I mean, they're, they're not joking, okay? You, you see that there is even an anomalous point here. So, and, uh, so be careful with these guys, okay? So, well, my, the title of my talk is uh, Extending the Lambda CDM Model Through Spatial Anisotropies. This is a, uh, I will talk mostly about my, uh, essentially all my works in, in this uh, subject. And this is working in collaboration with uh, Guillermo Marugan from Spain, Saulo Carneiro from uh, Brazil, and uh, Cyril Pitrou and Jean-Philippe Uzan from, from France. So uh, basically, I, I want to focus on, uh, start with the very, very basics. So we know that the standard, since, we're, since I want to discuss extensions of the standard model, so let me first uh, say what the standard model is all about. So we know that the standard model is, is based on the, the combination of these three main ingredients, okay? So we, we suppose that general relativity is valid and we, uh, 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 in scales above 100 megaparsecs. This is a, a hypothesis that we, we know how to, to I mean, s sometimes it, we, we change this hypothesis to something else. The second hypothesis is that the standard model of particle physics works on cosmological scales. And the third hypothesis is that the, the universe is as symmetric as possible, okay? So uh, usually, since we, there are features in, the in, in our universe that we don't understand very well, we like to to play with these ingredients to, to see we, if we can get a better explanation of the universe. Uh, and, and usually the third hypothesis here is, uh, it's, it's for, well, for good reasons, it's not very uh, uh, popular among these other two when you want to modify to see uh, if you can get a better explanation of the universe. But that's, that's where I want to focus during this talk, okay? I want to say, uh, we, we, regardless of the existence of CMB anomalies or whatsoever, I want to see, uh, I want to test this hypothesis, okay, to see whether we can get a better description of the universe if we let this symmetry hypothesis go, okay? So, uh, in very general, we, we know that the, the universe could be homogeneous and isotropic, so uh, that's the, the, the most famous description that we have, okay? So you have, uh, symmetry, but uh, you have rotational and translational symmetry in this case. You, you could also have a universe in which you have trans translational, uh, uh, translational symmetry, but not rotational symmetry, okay? Uh, which is, would be a Bianchi universe, for example. And you could also have a universe in which you don't have neither rotational invariance nor, nor translational invariance, okay? That's, th th these are just three examples you, you I mean, there are, many others which I, I'm not going into the details here, but just to let, to let, uh, to explain things clearly. And uh, the thing is that uh, we suppose that the universe is described by the Friedman metric in which you have uh, homogeneity and isotropy, okay? And if you, if you have a metric which uh, obeys the symmetries, then you, you do some calculations and then you find that the CMB is the CMB that we observe, okay? very uh, close to the CMB that we observe. But the thing is that uh, the opposite is not, is not true. I mean, wh what I'm saying is that if you have a metric like this, then the CMB is given by this. But if you, if you take the CMB as your starting point, then that's not certain that you have a metric which is homogeneous and isotropic, okay? Uh, also, we, we should uh, uh, realize that CMB is a, is a picture of the, the early universe, okay? So this is, telling that, this is telling us that the early universe was isotropic, but that doesn't mean that the, uh, the universe today is isotropic, okay? And even uh, as I'm trying to argue here, it, it, even if this picture looks isotropic, that, that could not be the case, okay? Uh, and uh, so I'm also going to uh, argue in this talk that if, if we're trying to measure late time anisotropies in the universe, then weak lensing is a very powerful uh, probe of uh, the geometry of the universe at late times, okay? So uh, the, the, the message that I, I want to deliver in this talk is uh, I, 
I, I want to be very simple here. Is uh, the first the first message is is that I I uh, I want to argue that the the most the simplest extension of the the standard uh, metric of the universe is an, an isotropic metric. Okay, that's that's the most simplest thing you can do beyond the the isotropic uh, metric. I want to show. I want to argue also that perturbation theory in these models is is possible. It's, it, it is feasible. Okay, we, we can do it, and uh, we, people are starting to do it more and more. Uh, also, I want to show you that there's much more to an isotropy than just an isotropy. What I mean by that is that we we tend to think of an isotropy as an isotropic expansion, but there there are ways to have an isotropy which is not present in the expansion of the universe. Okay. Uh, the second message is that uh, it's somehow related to the first, is that there, there are ways to evade the isotropy of the CMB, okay? The, co the, the severe constraints from CMB, we can, we can evade them. And, uh, and I, I will show you also that the B modes of cosmic shear in the weak lens in observables is a direct tracer of late time anisotropy, okay? So this talk is, um, I'm going to divide this talk in three parts. The first part I will talk about linear perturbation theory in uh, so a few uh, uh, different uh, space-time uh, geometries. Then I will discuss a little bit about primordial anisotropies, which was pretty much the, the subject of yesterday's talk, but I, I, will, I will try to focus more on the tec technicalities of uh, uh, getting anisotropies, and then the, in the third part of my talk, I will talk about late time anisotropies, okay? Okay. So there is a very, uh, uh, I, I'd like to, you to think of, of these, two, uh, these two parts, that there is a very uh, easy way to, to understand what's going on, is uh, that in, in, when, I, when I talk about primordial anisotropies, what I mean is that the, the power spectrum of the original perturbations is by construction anisotropic, okay? So the statistics of the, the primordial fluctuations, they are anisotropic. But the transfer function of the fluctuations, they are isotropic. So what, what I mean by that is that the universe starts in a state which is very anisotropic, okay? And then it isotropizes somehow and evolves uh, isotropically. So, so the after inflation, the whole evolution is isotropic, and therefore the transfer function is perfectly isotropic, okay? But the power spectrum is not. And in the second case, it's the opposite. So I have, in the second case, I have a universe which starts isotropic, but for some mechanisms that we don't know, it anisotropizes at late time. So in this case, the power spectrum is isotropic, but the transfer, the transfer function is anisotropic, okay? So this is a very uh, easy way to, to distinguish uh, w w uh, the main difference between these this two cases. Of course, you, 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 can, you can always complicate things and you can suppose that everything is anisotropic, but we're, we're starting simple here. So the first part of my talk is linear perturbation theory, okay? So I, I want to uh, talk a little bit about how, how can we do perturbation theory in anisotropic, a few classes of anisotropic space times. And uh, the general requirements are, I mean, uh, this is well known, we just, uh, take the space-time metric and we add linear perturbations above it, okay? We do the same with the energy momentum tensor. And this is, this is quite general, okay? You, you can always do it and linearize field equations. But then there is, uh, if you want to do computations, you want to know what are the effective degrees of freedom of the perturbations, okay? And in order to know what, it, what the effective degrees of freedom of the perturbations are, you need to, to use as much as possible the symmetries of the space-time to classify these degrees of freedom. So for example, in Friedman, Robertson, Walker, uh, we usually, we, uh, the, the, the spatial sections of the universe are the most symmetric possible, okay? So in this case, you have a three-dimensional symmetric space, and what we usually do is that since this is, space here is max, maximally symmetrical, we can we can put in this space either, either scalars, vectors, and tensors, okay? So this is what we call the SVT decomposition of the space-time, okay? Uh, this, is, this can always be done in, in, in Friedman universes, and we do it because in the linear regime, each of these models, they evolve, they evolve independently. So it's, it's, uh, this is a very useful way to do Fourier analysis and tr keep track of each mode separately, okay? 
Now, uh, I want also to, to do perturbation theory in some spaces in which you cannot do a, a 1 plus 3 splitting, in, in the sense that the, if you take a spatial section of certain Bianchi space times, this spatial section is not a, a three-dimensional maximally symmetrical space. For example, you can combine a two-dimensional space with a, a one-dimensional space. Okay, so in this, is, in this case, you have naturally a 1 plus 2 plus 1 splitting. Okay, so uh, the, the, the most uh, natural thing to do here in terms of uh, 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 classifying the degrees of freedom is to do a scalar vector decomposition in this space and a scalar decomposition in this space. Okay, so you, you, you might ask me why, why can I, can't I have a tensor here? It's just a very easy task to do a, a counting of the degrees of freedom. And then you see that you cannot plug a, a, a traceless, uh, symmetric traceless tensor in this space because simply there, there's not enough degrees of freedom. It's, it's trivial. If you, if you put a traceless symmetric tensor here, it's a zero tensor. Okay? So it's simply you do a counting of the degrees of freedom and it's impossible. Okay? And in one dimensional space, all you can have is a scalar. You, can, you cannot have neither tensors nor vectors. Okay? Uh, so this is the case, for example, with Bianchi universes in, 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 you, in which you have axial symmetry. Okay? And in, in the Bianchi 1 universe, the th situation is, is even uh, more complicated because I I if you take a picture of Bianchi 1 universe, then the, the space is, is Euclidean. Okay? But if you, if you take another picture one second later, it's another Euclid Euclidean space which is not related to the first one. So what the, the best you can do here is do a 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus, plus 1 splitting. Okay, so you, 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 you then you have one scalar degree of freedom in which uh, uh, dimension. Okay, uh, this is not what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to follow a different route here and I'm going to apply the SVT decomposition in the Bianchi 1 space time, but I'll, I'll, I'll pay a very uh, uh, expensive uh, price on this, okay, by doing this. I'll, I'll, I'll show you how. And then uh, once, you, once you know how to extract the perturbations, uh, the degrees of freedom of the perturbations, this is a very crucial step. Uh, you need you need a basis, a complete basis of spatial eigenfunctions because simply you, you cannot compute a power spectrum without these guys, okay? So since nowadays we have data to, to compare with theories and we need to compute power spectrums. This is a, a very important uh, part of the computation and you, you cannot do it, it without these with, without this basis functions, okay? So this is a very crucial step of the, of the program. And in this talk, I will, I will do perturbation theory in Bianchi 1 space-time, Bianchi 3 space-time, and Kantov-Sachs space-time. Okay? So let me start with the, the simplest case, Bianchi 1. Uh, so I have, uh, very simply, I have a background metric in which you have three different scale factors. Okay? So uh, each direction ex expands with its own scale factor. This could be re can be reparametrized re in a very simple way. Uh, this looks very much like the Friedman metric uh, uh, up to the fact that this, this, uh, the spatial metric now depends on time. Okay? So uh, this is basically telling you that there is a spatial shear as the universe expands. Okay? And in order to sustain this anisotropy, you need an uh, energy momentum tensor which has a source of anisotropy. Okay? Then the equations of, of motion, the background equations of motions are given by this. And you can, you, you can have a formal solution uh, if you suppose, for example, that the, the stress tensor works like an anisotropic pressure, okay? Suppose that the, the dark energy is anisotropic, so I would have a pressure which is, looks like this, so I, I just have uh, the dark energy equation of states times uh, uh, equation of state which is anisotropic. And for this, for this guy here, I can have a formal solution for the shear, the spatial shear and the dark energy, uh, energy, energy density. So uh, note here that when I, uh, the shear, I didn't, I didn't write its definition here, but the, sh the spatial shear is defined as the time derivative of the spatial metric, okay? So sigma is just gamma prime, okay? 
So note here that there are two modes in this solution. There's one decay, this C is constant, so there's a decaying mode and there's a growing mode, okay? So the first thing that we can notice is that if the decaying mode is not zero, then the, the, directions of, uh, the, the directions of anisotropy are not the same as the directions of the pressure, okay? So if only, only if this, this decay mode is zero, I will have uh, uh, the directions of the anisotrop anisotropic pressure uh, being the same as the directions of the expansion, okay? Okay, good. So, uh, so I will start doing perturbation theory in Bianchi one space time, so I, 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 do, I do exactly the opposite of uh, what, I, what I just told you here, okay? I, I will not do, do a decomposition like this, I will do a decomposition like this, and I will pay a price for this. So I do decomposition in the usual, in the usual way. I, I mean, I take scalars, uh, vectors I decompose like gradients of scalars plus uh, vectors with no divergences. And uh, any symmetric ten tensor, I do a decomposition like this. See that now I have an extra term here which accounts to the fact that the, the background space-time is anisotropic. And I impose the usual transversality conditions, okay? And then, as I told you, see, this, this decomposition is not the best for this space-time because this space-time, you cannot do a one plus three splitting in the usual way, so, okay? So the, the, the best thing you, uh, to do here was to have three scalars. But I'm, I'm not doing this, I'm doing the usual decomposition. And the price, the price I pay for that is that uh, these modes, they are decoupled at a given time, but one second after, they, de they couple. So that's the price I pay, okay? So modes will couple through all the evolution of the universe, okay? Uh, so uh, once, once this is done, I, can, I, can, uh, I need my, the eigenfunctions of my space. And since the Bianchi 1 space spatial sections are Euclidean, the eigenfunctions are plane waves, okay? So I do a standard Fourier transform, okay? Uh, given, if you give me any scalar function, I can do this transform like this. But the important thing now is that the wave vectors, they, uh, they depend on time, okay? So this, this guy here uh, is independent of time, but the, this, the, the co-vector uh, is, uh, evolves with time, okay? And in particular, the, the modulus of the wave vector also evolves with time. So this, this will have uh, important consequences for, uh, for, uh, for inflation, okay? If you want to quantize uh, if you want to do inflation in this scenario, then this will be a complicating factor, but you cannot avoid this, okay? So, uh, and there's an, another practical complication which arises is that because, because the Fourier modes, they depend on time, you cannot, you cannot do a, uh, you cannot separate scalar vector and tensor modes as you, as, you, as you usually do, because, for example, if you take an equation like this, uh, and you take its time derivative, then uh, you, can, you can do a Helmholtz decomposition in a standard way. But if you now take a, a time derivative of a quantity like this, since this guy here is time dependent, then this does not commute with time derivative, okay? So you cannot extract scalar modes independently of the vector modes. They are they're all, all, all coupled together, okay? But, but that doesn't mean that you cannot do perturbation theory. You can do, you just need to keep track of all the modes, okay? And uh, actually, it, it's kind of a surprise that if you identify the effective degrees of freedom, there, there are just three, okay? Just like in, in the standard friedman hobertson walker case. So you have uh, a scalar degree of freedom, which is the, the standard mukhanov sazak variable, okay? And you have two uh, tensor polarizations, okay? So as I was saying this morning, I was talking uh, to, uh, I don't know, uh, Jack this morning. Uh, the, the vector degrees of freedom, they do, not, they do not have dynamics, okay? So they do not appear as, they, they appear as a constrained equation, okay? So they disappear completely. And the main characteristics of this, this, uh, the systems of equations is that, well, as I said already, vector modes have no dynamics. If, if not sourced, of course, you can always source the vector modes. Uh, yes? Uh, no, the, 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 they, they appear as a constraint equation. They just, I mean, if you play with the equations, they just disappear. They, they, yeah, they are not dynamical. 
Yes, yes. I mean, they are there, but they are not, I mean. They have no means of imposing uh, initial condition on the natural system? No, yeah, because they, they, they obey, obey a first order differential equation, okay? Uh, Sorry, I elaborate on this. This is based on the assumption that your original anisotropy of your Bianchi 1 space is not due to the presence of some physical vector field. No, 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 it's just the geometry. Exactly. Just the geometry. If, if the geometry is associated, you know, as we yes. said yesterday. Yes. It's the, it's the same comment, yes. The same comment I made, yes. Exactly. Yeah. The number sure. of degrees of freedom does not depend on the solution, but only on the source. Exactly. It's three, like in the normal. Yeah, but but unless, but unless there are vectors. Unless there are other sources. But Patrick's point is, is I mean, uh, is that uh, this th the vector modes they obey a first order differential equation regardless of the source. Okay, so so that's true. And uh, also these these uh, polarization modes they they have different dynamics. They they evolve according to different equations. And this is a specific signatures of this space time. This does not happen in isotropic space times. Okay. Sure. But the, but this but the, but then but the, the the source can always obey. I mean, it will it will it will obey a second order differential equation. But but here I mean the vector modes of the geometry. Yeah. It's the vector mode of the metric. Yeah, this is what they want to do. They couple. <laughs> they couple. They couple. But the, but the vector mode of the metric, the, the left hand side has a single derivative. It's. So you're Yes. I mean, okay. Yeah. If one has yeah. Then that's yeah. I mean, yeah. I guess another way of saying this in in the other direction is to say that gravity has always two degrees of freedom physical. Yeah. In this case, you are you are assuming that there is some scalar field around of some scalar yeah. degree of freedom. So there is one yeah. degree of freedom. If you were adding more vectors, you would yeah. have more vectors. Is it okay if I if I move this oh. thing here? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. So yeah, that that's it. Yeah. So. The equations will look like this. They, they are now s uh, strongly coupled, and they are coupled because, uh, as I told you, uh, scalar vector and tensor modes, they couple with the evolution of the, the universe. So there's no way to, to uncouple them, OK? So they obey us uh, uh, basically a, a harmonic oscillation equation with a coupling matrix, which is non-diagonal, OK? And these terms here uh, in the off-diagonal, uh, they are the coupling functions, okay? So here, I, I just make a very simple plot of this, uh, these functions here, omega and gamma, okay? And you see that they, of course, they depend on the direction of the expansion. So for each Fourier mode, they behave differently, okay? So this is a plot for the Fourier mode x, y, and z, okay? And you see that they behave completely different, but they, they do azotropize. So when the universe expands, this guy here, these guys, they eventually go to zero, and in, in a few e-folds, you have an isotropic universe. Okay? So what's the it's just a cosmological constant. Oh, okay. okay? Just a cosmological constant. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I will stop here for the moment. I will explain how to do perturbation theory in, a, in another uh, space time, but then I will come back to show how you, do, how you use this to do inflation. Okay? So let me now talk about a different, different setup. In, uh, I, I want to do perturbation theory in both Bianchi tree and Kantowski Sachs spaces. And why I, why I want to do uh, perturbation theory in these cases, I, I will show you in a moment. But these are spaces uh, in which, uh, I mean, I could have three scale factors, but here I, I, I'm just choosing two. So I have, uh, these are, are spaces which they do not have a, a, a friedman hobartson walker limit in the sense that they are anisotropic always, okay? They have spatial curvature, and this is spatial curvature, this is not isotropic. So I have a, I have a two dimension, I have a composition of a two dimensional space with a one dimensional space. So this space here is curved and this is flat, okay? So this is not Friedman, even, even if A equals B, this is not Friedman, okay? Uh, so for example, uh, in the Bianchi tree case, I have the, the, this metric here is a pseudosphere, okay? And this is the real line. And in the kantowski sachs case, this metric here is the sphere, and this is the real line, okay? So the curvature here is constant, and here is zero. So, so we say that this is space times they have an isotropic curvature, okay? And this also, here the, cur the curvature is constant, and, this, and the curvature here is zero, okay? 
So what, why, why am I interested in these spaces is because uh, since the question is, since the, since the curvature is already anisotropy, anisotropic, do I need to keep the anisotropic Exp the anisotropy in the expansion. So the metric is already anisotropic at some level. So do I have do I have to keep two different scale factors? Okay, and the answer is no. You, you don't you don't need to keep this scale factor. So in, in, uh, another way of saying this is is that I I can have a single scale factor and a, an isotropic curvature, provided that of course I have some uh, energy momentum tensor with. An, uh, uh, non-perfect fluid, okay? So m the, the idea here is that I have a metric which is anisotropic but has only one scale factor, okay? So in the anisotropy, the anisotropy of this solution is in the spatial curvature, not in the expansion, okay? This simplifies uh, perturbation theory tremendously, okay? Uh, Yeah, well, yeah, that, that's a good question. You, you need, you need to, you need to, there's some fine tuning here because you need to choose a, a, a stress tensor which will give, which will allow you to, to have A equals B, okay? Then, uh, of course, you can ask uh, what, what's, why should I expect this to be the case? But I mean, this is no different than, than, than using a vector field to, to, to sustain, uh, to sustain an isotropy, okay? So, I mean, even in Bianchi one space time, you, you need a, an extra degree of freedom to, to keep the universe anisotropic. So here, my, my extra degree of freedom is, is in the stress tensor, in the stress component of the it's energy momentum tensor. In that sense. Sorry? It's making it better behaved, your, your factor. Uh, Sorry, I, I, if you're. Well, you're saying in one case you use the vector field to make something anisotropic. Yes. Yeah, here, here I'm using an, an extra field to have the expansion to be isotropic. Okay. Okay? Be because the, 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 the curvature is already anisotropic, okay? Uh, so this is called shear-free anisotropy because the universe is uh, anisotropic, but the expansion is perfectly isotropic, okay? So there's a very simple statement which, uh, simpl which uh, uh, states, uh, there's a very simple way to state this which is to say that anisotropic models cannot have perfect fluid content and shear-free time-like congruence at the same time. So either they have a perfect fluid or they have a shear-free uh, time-like evolution, uh, but not both at the same time, okay? And the thing is that since we usually think of this, the stress tensor as proportional to the background shear, then if this is zero, this guy is zero, okay? Uh, but that's, th that's not the only choice. I could have a, an uh, a stress tensor which is not proportional to the shear. Then, if you look to the, to the, to the uh, dynamical equations, uh, this is the ratio of the equation, and this is the shear evolution equation, okay? So if you see that you can, you can choose the shear to be exactly zero, provided that this term here is proportional to, is equal to this term here. So then you, then you satisfy this equation exactly, you have a solution which is shear free, in, in other words, in the shear is exactly zero, but you do have an isotropy because you do have a stress tensor which is non-zero and it's proportional to the electric part of the Vios tensor, okay? So this, uh, this was done by Mimoso and Crawford. It's a, a paper which is already uh, a little bit old. And, 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 and this is called the shear free solution, okay? So you have zero shear, the expansion is perfectly isotropic, and, but you do have an isotropy uh, in the energy momentum tensor. And, and, and the interesting thing here is that because, you, because uh, you have only one scale factor, the CMB at the background level is exactly isotropic, okay? <laughs> so, so the constraints are, please? This is very fine tuned somehow. Yes, so yes. Uh, I don't know, I don't know. But uh, what, I, what I do know is that there are many ways to achieve this. I mean, even uh, you can do this with scalar fields, with three form fields, and it's. I think the stability is a bit it, project, yeah. I don't think it's. it's I, I work on that on a specific model. For a specific model, uh, there are some stabilities. Okay. 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 No, I, well, I just, I just mentioned, but uh, 
what I was telling you is that there are, uh, so you verify this for the tree form? Yeah. Okay. So there are, there are many ways to implement this with uh, scalar fields, with uh, three form fields, with vector fields, okay? So yes, that's, that's something to check whether it's stable, okay? Then uh, once I do this, I, I have a metric which has a single scale factor, okay? And, uh, and a space time metric, uh, and a spatial metric which is anisotropic, okay? So it's, uh, the, the expansion is isotropic, but the curvature is not, spatial curvature. So as I was telling you, you can do this with an isotropic stress, uh, with a massless scalar field, or, or with a tree form field, which is what uh, David did. And then the, the dynamics, the background dynamics, are exactly the friedman hobertson walker uh, dynamics. And the curvature here decays exactly as 1 over a square. Okay, so. Uh, uh, this is very interesting because you, you would not, uh, just by looking to the CMB, you cannot, I mean, I, I ju this is just a counterexample that the space-time is not necessarily isotropic, okay? Because the expansion is, uh, the, the evolution goes exactly like a friedman hobertson walker metric, but, the, but it's not with curvature, okay? So this can decay away. This, is, this gives you a late-time universe which looks pretty much like ours, but the, the, the space-time, is the geometry is not. It's not uh, the most symmetric one, okay? Okay, so the natural splitting that I can do here is, the, is one plus two splitting. So in this, in this two-dimensional space, I do a scalar vector decomposition like this. And in the one-dimensional space, there's, there can only be vectors, a scalars, as usual. And uh, the energy momentum tensor now has an extra component here, which I need to perturb as well, okay? So the feature is that uh, you have no non-trivial transverse and trace-free trace -free tensor modes, okay? You, on, you, you only have scalar and vector modes. But uh, here, there are no dynamical coupling of the modes because I have only one scale factor. So this is completely different from the Bianchi 1 situation because there, the coupling arises because I have, I have shear, spatial shear. And since this is a shear-free solution, scalar and vector modes, they evolve completely independently, okay? So they, they do not couple. And what is important, the perturbations to this guy here, they do not grow, they decay. Okay, so uh, if you do a perturbation in this quantity here, it will decay with the scale factor. So this is important for, I mean, from the phenomenological point of view because uh, you, you, if this grows, then you need to explain why we don't, we don't see it today, okay? Okay, very good. So uh, now, for the, for the Fourier analysis, I need to find the, the solutions of the Laplacian to, to decompose my quantities and to compute the power spectrum, okay? So, you, 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 as it turns out, you can find the solutions. For the Bianchi tree case, they are given by this. This is just standard plane wave with, with uh, this is called a conic function. And for the Kantowski sachs this is just plane waves times a, a Legendre polynomial, okay? But one, there's one interesting thing here, which is that the eigenvalue of the Laplacian, it has a lower limit, okay? So you cannot, so take, take a wave which has k equals zero and l equals zero here, and then k is always greater than, uh, k squares are always greater than one over four, and this is telling you that you cannot have a wave in this space whose wa uh, which wave, wavelength is, is larger than the curvature scale, okay? All the perturbations have wavelength which are smaller than the curvature scale. Uh, this Sorry, I'm confused by the last statement. So, so Bianchi 3 has uh, the curved sections that are hyperbolic. Yes, yes. So I can think of infinitely large wavelengths in that case, right? You can, you can. But, but this, 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 these modes, they, they do not belong to the, to the spectrum of the Laplacian. I mean, you, you can always think of a wave which has a wavelength as big as you want, but what I'm saying is that if you want to, if you want a basis of complete eigenfunctions, in which you can decompose any function, a square integrable function, yeah. in the standard way, then this this is the condition. I mean, the, these waves are not normalizable. So why, why those very long wavelengths don't appear? They are not normalizable. They are not normalizable. No, okay, I see. Okay. I mean, y you can include them. Because I, you know, I would have thought that you had. A Rather, you know, an upper bound there. But but space, but you do you do. But you do. I mean, you, here as well because, for example, but, the, but here it's, it's clear that 
clear that this, you yes. know, the space is finite, so you cannot have a Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, okay. but that's so the case as well. But this is not this is not exclu exclusive of Bianchi, okay? Even in, in, in open Friedman Hobartson Walker this happens. Okay. This is this is yeah, not it's just it's just uh, uh, normal non normalizable. Model. Yes, yes. Okay. The, the, the modes, these modes in which k square is, is smaller than one over four, they are not normalizable. It's that's a fact. <laughs> it's, it's it happens even in B, in Friedman. Okay, in in Friedman, this one over four changes to one over two, so it's the same thing. I'm a little confused. I mean, okay, so if we have flat space, mm -hmm. do a, uh, the, you know, harmonic expansion, we have the, the spherical Bessel function. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they both, you know, aren't normalizable. The, 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 there's a, you know, delta function. Yeah, yeah, the, these are... And then there's this literature. I've never really understood it about super curvature modes and that you have to add these modes. Yeah, both. So... Yes, yeah, there's a paper uh, uh, in which the authors claim that the the, the most general perturbation can be constructed with subcurvature modes. Okay, so take the gravitational potential. The most general gravitational potential can be constructed with these perturbations alone, subcurvature perturbations. Okay, that that's the mathematical fact. You, you if you give me a function, if you give a, comp a basis of complete eigenfunctions, then I can expand any function in terms of this basis. Okay, but what they're saying is that the, that doesn't mean that the most general Gaussian field can be expanded only with this basis. Then they're saying that if you want the most general Gaussian field, you also need to include sub subcurvature modes. But we're interested in the most general Gaussian field. Uh, I'm not interested in, in the most general Gaussian field because in the end, what, if I want to, com to compare this with our universe, <coughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to suppose that the curvature is very, very large. So I'm going to suppose that my universe is a very small patch of a Bianchi tree universe. So in any event, what I call super, uh, what I call a very large wavelength is actually a very small wavelength of a very larger uh, patch. So, I'm not sure if use that but like there are these papers by Sasaki and some other authors where they try to to do some sort of bizarre things with super. Yeah, but, but here I'm trying to be very standard. I mean, um, all, all I'm doing, uh, I'm, I'm finding the the, the eigenfunctions of I the mean, Laplace. I think what you're doing is fine. You one can't really say, yeah. oh, well, um, I can exercise these other Yes, you can, you can. No. You can. I mean, but, but then if you want to include su super curvature modes, you need to think of, a, of some mechanism which is, is non-standard. I mean, if, 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 you, if you think that pr primordial fluctuations were sorted by inflation, and you're talking about standard quantum mechanics, then these are the modes that are, are, are excited. If, if you want to include sub, super curvature modes, that's something non-standard. You can do it. There you are can papers do. that claim the, the um, super curvature modes get excited. I can't say that I understand I do, well enough to I don't say, well, I, 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 I'm sure that mm -hmm. they're correct mm -hmm. if the mm -hmm. claim is mm -hmm. out there. OK, but well, my, my claim is that the most general gravitational potential can be expanded like this. This is enough. Okay? So, okay, uh, let, let's do one thing. This looks like a good discussion for after call. Okay, uh, okay. Because I have also some, some okay. questions. Okay. Okay. Well, okay, so just to keep uh, moving, so then this is always larger than the curvature scale, and, and in the, in the, uh, if, you th if you think of the curvature scale as very, very large, then these eigenfunctions become the standard uh, waves of uh, Friedman, Hobbes, and Walker universe, but here it's written in, in cylindrical coordinates, which is not very standard. But this is this is these are the eigenfunctions. Okay, so then you do you do perturbation theory as well. You you do identify the degrees of freedom. There are two uh, gravitational uh, mo gravitational waves modes. They they also behave differently. The dynamics is not the same, and here you see the curvature appearing. Okay, the spatial curvature. And you see that they do not couple. They, these equations, they evolve independently because 
This is a shear free uh, uh, model, okay? And as I told you before, the perturbation in the stress tensor decays with the scale factor. So if you, if you apply this in an inflationary scenario, this will decay away. So uh, scalar modes, so, so this equation here is exactly the mukhanov sazaki equation in the standard friedman robertson walker universe, except for the fact that this Laplacian is different. Okay, but this equation is formally the same. So the time evolution is exactly the same. But what changes is the geometry in the eigenfunctions, okay? And uh, again, the polarization of gravitational waves, they evolve differently. So this is a very, uh, seems to be a very general, generic feature of anisotropic spacetimes. Okay, so let, I, want, I want now to apply these two, uh, these two schemes to, to inflation, okay? So uh, here is uh, for the Bianchi 1 universe, it, suppose that I have just a cosmological constant in the, in the, in the uh, matter sector, then the, I, can, I can find an exact solution to the scale factors. This is given by this expression here. Uh, x, y is, y is either one, two, or three, and this is the three scale factors. And you can see that they evolve independently, but there's always one scale factor in the past which is growing, okay? So this is needed to ensure that the moving volume is always constant, okay? Uh, and this alpha parameter here is, is telling you which direction is going to expand initially and which direction is going to contract initially. So, and here we have a very special case of the uh, rotationally symmetric uh, Bianchi 1 universe, which is, um, I, I was uh, uh, surprised to see that this is a, arises as a stable uh, solution in, in vector field models, because if you, if you think in terms of this parameter alpha here, this is a new measure, a model with, an, uh, I mean, with a very, very particular choice of this alpha parameter here, so, okay? So for me, it's very surprising that this, this is uh, the model which is stabilized by, by vector fields. And this is the case with planar, planar symmetry, okay? Then uh, if you do inflation in, in these space times, what happens is that uh, inflation will not start until the shear decays away. So you have two phases. You have first a phase in which the shear is going to zero, and once the shear is going to zero, the universe starts inflating. Okay, so you have two, two types of attractors here. You have a shear uh, going to zero attractor, and then you have a slow row attractor, okay? If you do a three-dimensional plot, uh, including the shear in the, in the z-axis, then you see that initially the shear goes to zero, and once the shear is zero, inflation starts. So this is a kind of, I mean, that's, that's what inflation is supposed to do, of course. But somehow this is a pity because uh, we know that uh, the signatures of this phase here will, will be very hard to measure because the universe is going to inflate once this is zero, okay? This feature here is telling me that if I want to do quantization, then I'm going to, to play with, this, with the fact that I can, when I can do quantization, the universe is not uh, anisotropic anymore. So uh, the, the, uh, the other, uh, another way of seeing this is that if you take any wave uh, Fourier wave uh, mode and you and you do uh, since these guys uh, the, uh, each Fourier mode evolves with time and you, you take this uh, each of these modes and you go back back in the past then you see that two of them they increase in the past but there's a, a, always one Fourier mode which which uh, which decays so this means that there's always one uh, direction which is going to contract in the past and then you cannot quantize these modes because there's always one direction which is, is going to be very small. Another way of seeing this is that if, if, you, if you take your equations and you write them in the WKB approximation and you make a plot of this quantity, of, of course when this quantity is zero, you, you can impose plane wave initial conditions, okay? So if you, if, you, if you do a plot of this quantity in friedman robertson walker universe, you see that in the past this quantity is always zero. So you can always impose a bunch Davis vacuum in the past because this is zero. But in Bianchi 1 universe, when you go to the past, this quantity is zero, but after a certain uh, uh, moment of time, it starts growing again. Then you cannot quantize in this region because, you, I mean, you cannot, you cannot impose plane wave conditions, okay? So quantization can happen only, I mean, if you want to quantize and, and still keep the signatures of the shear, uh, the, the isotropic expansion, then you have a, a small window of time here in which you can do, in, you can impose plane wave initial conditions and 
ha still have a signature of an isotropic expansion, okay? Uh, and the, the observational constraints from C and B will tell you that the, uh, the shear, the, this ratio of the shear to the, to the Hubble uh, uh, parameter is less than 1%. Okay? <coughs> so these are the very tight constraints from the C and B in the anisotropic expansion of the universe. I mean, you, you can go on, you can compute the power spectrum. This is something that we discussed yesterday, so I'll just I'll, I'll skip this. You can compute, compute the power spectrum and then one, uh, I mean, uh, you can make a uh, plot of these quantities to see how they behave. The most, uh, in my opinion, the most interesting thing here is that you cannot couple even a nod mood pulse, which means that you cannot, for example, explain the, uh, the quadrupole topological alignment in this, in this uh, scenario because this is space times that are even under, under parity, okay? So there's no quadrupole octopole alignment. So this is a plot of the, of the spectrum. I'll just, I'll, I'll skip it and if you want, I can comment later on because I'm running short of my time. And now I want to do, I want to do the same thing for the Bianchi tree and Kantos sachs geometries, okay? So uh, since the modes do not couple, I can, uh, I can keep track of only scalar modes, okay? So I'll just keep scalar modes in my matrix. So uh, the way to, to introduce scalar degrees of freedom in the space time now, it's slightly different because the symmetries are different. This is a one plus two plus one splitting. So these are my degrees of freedom. And what actually you can show that during inflation, the, the, the energy momentum tensor uh, does not have a, a stress. And therefore, this quantity here is, is, is proportional to this quantity here, which is similar to what happens in Friedman universe. And moreover, you can show that if the universe is, inf is growing exponentially, then uh, this quantity here decays with one over a square, okay? And therefore, from the equations, uh, from, from the perturbed equations, you learn that these guys here are proportional. So wh what, what it means is that this is very interesting because if the universe is inflating, then the effective metric for the scalar degrees of freedom is exactly the same as in the uh, standard case, up to the fact that now this metric here is not just, uh, it could be the standard Friedman metric, but now it's also the Bianchi tree or Kantov Sachs metric. So you have, a, you have a formally identical parameterization for the metric, but with different uh, uh, dependence on, the, uh, on. I actually wonder how you can do that because, as you, you told us, in order to get these Bianchi tree and Kantov Sachs solution, you need to impose a very Mm -hmm. as a matter. Yes. And yes. It, it seems here that uh, you're considering as a sort of just a regular uh, single sorrow inflation. Yes, so yes, inflation, yes. Which I believe is not compatible with your previous assumption. No, no, you, you, can, you can have a scalar field, which is the inflaton, plus some extra uh, uh, energy momentum tensor, which, is, which you include in order to have an isotropic expansion. Yeah, but it has to dominate. No, the, the, this extra degrees of freedom, it decays. What, I mean, I, I, it's... But then I would have the feeling that as soon as it decays, then the, the universe ends up Friedman. No, 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 because the geometry is not Friedman. I mean, it, the, this, uh, uh, sorry. But then the, it becomes shear. No, 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 sorry, it sorry, shear, sorry. Which is produced by this. No, the, the, the perturbation of the, uh, this extra field that I include, uh, its perturbations decay. So I include a, a, an extra energy momentum tensor, and I have to perturb it, okay? Its perturbations decay. And this, the, the background value of this tensor, it's there just to maintain the, the expansion isotropic. Okay? So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not taking this very serious from the, from, the, from the fundamental point of view, more from the phenom phenomenological point of view. So you, another way of thinking of this is, think of this metric, okay? I have a space-time metric, and how perturbations would evolve in this metric. Okay, so now, okay, right. well we can discuss the perturbation of, the, of this extra thing which does, in, uh, which does make it uh, shear free. It decays, it, um, it decays, okay. So this means that if, uh, um, for example, uh, uh, since this uh, metric here is exactly the same as the standard metric, it means that the, the, the perturbations of Einstein's equations are exactly the same Okay, the time evolution of these quantities is exactly the same. All that changes is now that the Laplacian is different. So the, the, the geodesics here are different, and the metric here is different. So, but apart from that, everything is the same. So, so 
as a, a, a byproduct of this is that the Sachs-Wolf effect is exactly the same in this universe. Okay, so if the Sachs-Wolf effect is exactly the same, I can compute its contribution to C and B. So I can compute a two-point correlation function. I do. Uh, Sachs-Wolf effect is exactly the same, so the temperature is proportional to phi. I do a mode decomposition, as I as I told you before. And then uh, I use the fact now that the power spectrum uh, is, uh, depends on, a, uh, on the vector k, okay? It, because the, this universe is anisotropic. Then I, in principle, I, I, this requires quantization. I need to quantize the modes to, to, to know uh, what, what this guy looks like. But uh, what, what, what I claim here is that there is a, a simpler route, which is to say that when I take the limit in which n equals n prime, so in which the, the curvature is zero, okay, I should recover standard results. So the only way to recover standard results if, is if you fix this guy here by, by this condition, okay, this guy here is fixed, is fixed by these uh, functions. So I, inst uh, wh what I'm saying is that I'm, I'm making the imposition that when n equals n prime, I should have exactly the results that I have in the standard uh, theory. Okay, because locally the curvature is zero. Okay, so the only way to recover this imposition is to fix the power spectrum by this. So this is in the Bianchi tree case, and this is in the kantowski sachs case. Sorry, where does the direction dependence appear? There? It's here, because L is it's a, it's a Fourier mode. Okay. Okay, right. and and this it's, it's, not, it's not L of C. Uh, no. Okay, it depends. It depends on. It's about in the, one the Fourier mode of. Q. Yes, like yes, it, yes. It's Q times the, the yes. Z direction. Yes. And this red P of K is the standard P of K. Yeah, but, but what about in the one below in the it, it, it just happens that it's the proportionality factor is just a constant. But you, you so see... So there, is, so there is no direct... Yeah, dependence. yes. But you see, all I'm saying is that locally I want to recover standard results. And this fix, and this fix the power spectrum. That's all I'm saying. And it's kind of magic that in this case here, it's... It's proportional to the standard P of K. Sorry, I, I'm not sure I understand what you're doing then. But, uh, your your concern was that since you don't have you know you don't have modes leaving the horizon in one direction. No, I have. I do have modes leave the during during inflation. Uh huh. You have one direction that is called. called the no, no, no. Here, here, there's only one scale. Factor. Oh yeah. Sorry, sorry. I'm mixing with the previous. Okay. Graph. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, I mean, I, I want to argue that this is a very natural choice because I'm, all I'm saying is that locally I have to recover. If I take the two-point correlation function at zero lag, okay, if I do n equals n prime, then, then the results, they should agree. And this fix, this condition fix this function here. Okay? Why, why, why do you think uh, that in the kantowski soch case uh, the, the spectrum at the end is uh, non-dependent on the direction? Well, first, uh, this, uh, you, you always have uh, uh, these this spaces, they are, uh, they, they, have, uh, they are locally rotationally symmetric, okay? So it's natural that they depend only on two Fourier modes because there's al always the third mode which is, does not appear. And here, well, uh, th there's something important which I should uh, include here. Uh, this is the, 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 uh, the functional dependence of this function is the same, but remember that this Q here <coughs> has that limitation that I've, I've shown before, it, that it has always to be larger than 1 over 4, okay? But I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't have a good answer right now for, as to why this is exactly <coughs> looks like this, but this arises from this imposition, okay? Sorry, sorry, Patrick. Aren't you doing something bizarre from the point of view of quantization if you are doing that? I understand your argument. But then if you were to, what would be, what would be translated into when you actually do the, the, the yes. quantization? Yes, yes. Uh, but this, yeah. But I, I, I don't, I, you're right. But I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to push this too uh, much in the, in the sense of, uh, I don't want to think of this as, as uh, arising from inflation, uh, inflation per se. I just want to know uh, if, I, if I have a, if, if, I happen, if I happen to live in a patch of a Bianchi tree universe, then I want to see the effect of this wave, these waves in the sachs wolf effect. So, so this is more a phenomenological approach, okay? Of course, if you want a more uh, uh, 
fundamental approach, you need to quantize this guy. Okay. So uh, what happens is that if I now suppose that I live in a very, uh, bon, well, so first let me, let me follow this program here and compute this quantity, okay? So this quantity for the Bianchi, uh, for the Friedman Robertson Walker looks like this. For the Bianchi tree case, it looks like this. And now I see that th there's a modification on the geodesics of photons, okay? And for the Cantal Sachs case, it behaves like this. And there's also a modification uh, due to geodesics of uh, light. And now I suppose, let, let us suppose that I, I live in a very, very small patch of a very, very large Bianchi tree universe or a Cantal Sachs universe, okay? So I suppose that the curvature is very, very large and I do a Fourier expansion in powers, inverse powers of the curvature. So what I recover, of course, is the standard correlation function plus corrections, okay? So there are corrections that come from, from the geodesics and corrections that come from the eigenfunctions, okay? So this induces uh, off-diagonal correlations in the CMB, and as it happens, the first non-trivial one is uh, correlation between L and L plus 2. Again, because of the fact that this, these spaces, they are even under parity, okay? So this is a plot of, the, of, this, of this function here. Uh, the, the, the amplitude is arbitrary because I don't know how large the amplitude depend on, depends on L, and I don't know how the, the absolute value of L, okay? So uh, this is uh, in, in units of the curvature scale, but this is the spectrum uh, up to L equals, equals 100, okay? So in principle, uh, I could, I could uh, put lower bounds on this using CMB, okay? So this is ju uh, just a simple uh, uh, rough estimate of this, this curvature scale. It's, you can, you can, you, there are simple models that convinces you that this L has to be at least 100 times larger than the Hubble horizon today. Okay, so let me uh, go uh, to the third part of my talk, which is uh, how, how? 15 okay. minutes. Okay. So I want to uh, show that weak lensing is a very uh, powerful probe of late time anisotropies because uh, what happens is that if in, in, the standard, uh, uh, in the standard model, B modes of, the weak, of, uh, of weak lensing, they just appear as systematics or uh, they, they are not cosm of cosmological origin, okay? Uh, then if, if you're not in the standard model, then they will appear as a signature of, of the space-time. That, that's what I want to show to you. So this is just basics of uh, weak lensing. That I, I think I'll just uh, skip this because uh, if, if anyone has doubts, you can ask me later. Just, is, just weak lensing at a very basic level, okay? Uh, we're, we're just, uh, so the idea is that uh, there's uh, galaxies are here, sorry, are here. We're, th there's a source of uh, dark matter in the middle and we're making observations in this point. And so the, the fo photon geodesics, they are uh, distorted by this matter distribution, and so uh, the, the shape of these galaxies, they are distorted in the sky, okay? So there's a very natural way to do this, uh, this to measure this uh, shape deformation, which is to introduce a, a two-dimensional basis here and there, okay? And uh, we can always do a parallel propagation of this basis here along the geodesics of light. So, uh, I mean, if you, if you do all this uh, implementation, again, this is very standard uh, weak lens in a formalism, you get this uh, so-called Sachs equation here, which is actually written here. And this matrix D, A and B are indexes which run from one to two. So basically I take all my, uh, I'll take all the effects and I project these effects in a screen. Okay, so basically I'm, uh, uh, I have a two-dimensional effect which I project in, in a screen. Okay? And, and this matrix here is ba basically, it encodes all types of deformations that I can have in, in a two-dimensional space, okay? Uh, so it, this is directly related to the Ricci tensor, which encodes the effect of gravity, okay? So, uh, so I, I want to do weak lensing in, in without uh, any assumption of the space-time whatsoever, okay? Regardless of the space-time, I can always do a decomposition of this uh, tensor in, into its re irreducible pieces. So I write this as a scalar plus a spin two field. And this matrix here, I, I decompose it as a scalar plus a pseudo scalar plus a spin two field. So this is a, the most general decomposition of a symmetric two by two matrix. And this is the most general decomposition of a general two by two matrix, okay? So the idea is that you derive couple equations for, for uh, this quantity here. 
and you do a harmonic decomposition, then you do power spectrum, then you do data analysis. This is a very general uh, idea. Okay, so as I was telling you, this, this matrix here, it, it encodes the, sh the convergence of the, the bundle, the light bundle, okay? So it tells you how, the, how light can uh, converge or diverge. This, is a, this function here is called a twist, which is telling you how, how you can rotate the, 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 the bundle of the light, okay? And this is a shear, but here it's important, this is cosmic shear. It has nothing to do with, in, I mean, in principle, it's not the spatial shear of the space-time. This is cosmic shear, which arises even in, in the standard Friedman, Hobartson, Walker case, okay? So the effect of the convergence is just to even sharpen or uh, enlarge or uh, to change the, the, the bundle of light. The cosmic shear will, will distort the images, okay? And the twist, the, it will change the orientation of a galaxy, okay? So the evolution of these three quantities here are entirely determined by the background metric and initial conditions, okay? So for example, if I take, uh, if I take the shear, since the shear and the, and the twist, they are scalars, I do a standard decomposition in spherical harmonic, and uh, the, 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 the uh, cosmic shear is a spin two field, so I decompose in spin spherical harmonics. I do the same thing for the for the for the, geom the, the geometrical sector. Okay, so so there is a I do a, a Fourier decomposition of the Hubble uh, parameter. Uh, and notice here that this is completely general. Okay, I haven't I haven't fixed the space time, so this works for any space time. That's why the Hubble parameter could depend on the direction. I do the same thing for the Ricci scalar and for the Vio tensor, and then well, I do there's a, some. Uh, some mathematics that you can develop here, but the thing is that you can have an equa a coupled equation for all these quantities in which you can, you can I mean, you can, uh, if you do a f uh, harmonic decomposition, you can, you can find a Boltzmann hierarchy, just like the Boltzmann uh, hierarchy for CMB, and in principle you can solve all these quantities at any multiple that you uh, want, okay? So this is uh, what I was telling you. Do a, you do a harmonic decomposition and you do a, uh, 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 you, you find a Boltzmann, sorry, a Boltzmann uh, hierarchy for all the modes. Okay, so again, this, this is for any space-time, and I can solve th this in principle order by order in perturbations. So just a as a consistent check, I do this for, B for Friedman uh, universe, which is in which I know the results, okay? So what I find is, is that the E modes of weak landing, they are so sourced by the convergence at zero order, so this this is order zero, this is order one in perturbation, okay? So, so the E modes are sourced, so they, they grow. The B modes are not sourced, so if they are zero initially, they do not grow. So that's why we say that in, in Friedman universes, there, there are no B modes in the weak lensing, okay? Uh, the same thing happens for the twist and convergence. So the convergence is sourced, so uh, it will appear in Friedman universes, but the twist is not sourced, so it will not appear, okay? So this is what happens a, as expected. Now I want to do weak lensing in, in, in Bianchi one universes, okay? So uh, the general setup is again, I take this space-time metric for the Bianchi one universe uh, with an energy momentum tensor which has a stress component like this. Uh, the shear is, the, here is the spatial shear, is the, the time derivative of the metric. And I, su I will suppose that the, the stress tensor is just proportional to a constant equation of, an isotropic equation of state. This is the, the simplest generalization of uh, uh, dark energy equation of state, okay? So, uh, so our, mo our, our motivations here are, are twofold. First, I want to, we want to provide a new test of isotropy of late times, okay? And, uh, and this could be used to test the anisotropy of dark energy. As, so this is in, in response to, to Davi's uh, request yesterday, okay? So uh, we're, we're going to work here in order, I mean, there, there are both uh, observational constraints which suggest that the shear is very small. And there's also, from the technicalic point of view, it's uh, easier to work with equations if we suppose that the shear is very small. But we, we also know that this could not be very large, otherwise we, we would have already seen it. So, so besides treating perturbations of the metric as a small quantity, I, I will also suppose that the shear is a perturbation, okay? So I do a two-parameter uh, two uh, perturbation theory. I have two parameters which I treat as a small. 
So I have, uh, so when, uh, so background quantities I call uh, order zero, zero, which means that zero order in the shear and zero order in the perturbation of the metric. So there are quantities which are order one, zero, which means that they are first order in the shear and zero order in the metric perturbations, and so on and so forth, okay? So uh, you might be wondering why, if, if this is the most general perturbation in Friedman Hobartson Walker universe, why should you include this guy as a perturbation? Because this is already the most general perturbation. The thing is that this, this guy here is time dependent. So this looks like a zero mode, zero Fourier mode perturbation, which is not included here, okay? Well, uh, I go very quickly here because I don't have really time, but the idea is that you, you can solve the Sachs equation for, for weak lanes and observables. Uh, this allows you to determine the, the cosmic shear. And from the cosmic shear, I can compute like modes like the, the, the correlation between E, E modes and B, B modes. And this, this quantity here is directly, directly proportional to the spatial shear, not the weak lanes and shear, okay? So if the universe is Bianchi one, this guy here is non-zero, and I can, I can put constraints on this using uh, current observations, okay? So I, I'll just skip these details here. I can, I can explain you later if, if you want to know. But the, the main result is that if I, if I only keep the dominant term, okay, so the, the, cosmologic, uh, the, the cosmic shear of weak landing is proportional to this deviation angle, okay? And this deviation angle is a one zero quantity, which means that it's proportional only to the spatial shear of the Bianchi universe, okay? So this is directly proportional to the spatial shear. These derivatives here tell me that this effect is dominant at small scales. And, uh, and these quantities here, they are of order zero, one, which means that in order to evaluate these quantities, I can use standard transfer functions from, from C and B, let's say, because these, these guys here, they are evaluated in a purely friedman hobertson walker space-time, okay? So with this, I can compute the, the BB cross-correlation. It's given by this ugly expression here, okay? But the shear is included in this, in this term here, and you see that the, shear, the effect of the shear is to introduce a quadrupole, okay? And then, for, in order to, to, to raise these numbers that I want to see, I, I just, uh, we, we use the two very simple models, okay? A model in which the stress tensor is simply proportional to the dark energy density, energy density. And another model which is, we, we have chosen a function uh, to peak at around z equals zero, okay? This is very phenomenal logical. I just want to see, suppose that at z equals zero, I have some anisotropy which, which starts dominating, okay, for some reason. Then, uh, then I can, I can, I can uh, take some function which does this, okay, and this is what, what I call model B. So I have model A and model B. So this is the background evolution. This is model B, okay, it peaks around z equals zero, and this is model A. Of course, here, there, I, ha I have multiplied in by a factor of, of 100, okay, for, for you to see. Okay, and then uh, in order to compute this quantity here, we need to know uh, what's the distribution of sources as a function of the redshift. I, I need to know how many galaxies there is uh, in my experiment as a function of the redshift. And for this, we have used two uh, different experiments. Uh, one is the Euclid experiment, which gives you, uh, this is a fit based on the technicalities of the experiment. Okay, and this is for the SKA experiment. So for these two functions here, we have, we have a plot of the uh, power spectrum of BB and EE correlations, okay? So this is uh, Euclid for the EE, and this is SKA for EE. Here are both models, they, they, they are the same. And this is BB for Euclid for model A, and BB for Euclid for model B, and the same here for SKA. Okay, so with, with current uh, constraints on, uh, on the amplitude of these modes from, from SFHTLS, for example, we have this constraint that sigma over H0 today is, is less than point, point 0.4, okay? But we, we, we hope we can do much better with, we, with Euclid. Euclid will probably raise the sensitivity in, in this range of uh, mood poles that we're in, interested in by a, a factor of 50, so this will we will make our constraints better by uh, this, a, factor, a factor of 50, and this will hopefully give us uh, this, this constraint here, okay, this, this, this upper bound. So I, I, wa I also want to I just uh, say what I want to say without going into the details, that uh, if you measure these correlations here with, with uh, weak lensing, 
then you can, f in principle, you can fully reconstruct all the eigendirections of the expansion. Okay, so if you measure these cross correlations here, you can uh, you can put bounds on uh, each direction of expansion. Okay, so this is a, a new way of uh, of constraining late time anisotropy. Okay, uh, just a technical detail which is important. You can do this because you have precisely five you have precisely five components in each of these correlators and five is precisely the number of independent degrees of freedom in the shear so you can fully reconstruct the shear okay well that's all i wanted to say so my, my final remarks is that uh, homogeneous and uh, uh, especially anisotropic are the most straightforward gen generalization of uh, uh, friedman metrics perturbations in these models are possible uh, and uh, there, uh, what, I, what I show here in this uh, Bianchi tree and Cantos Sox model is just a, a, an attempt to show you that, in principle, you can evade CMB constraints, okay? Uh, from a phenomenological point of view, you can evade this, these constraints. I have also shown you that uh, weak lens in, uh, it's a very powerful probe of late time anisotropy, okay? And uh, we have proposed a new mechanism to, to measure uh, late time anisotropies from uh, the B modes of weak lensing. Okay, so that's that's how I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs>